followed all the path you have walked through, especially how we got from the Holocaust to the Nakba. Uh, although you stress that they are very, very uh, different, but since we are here to discuss uh, uh, Ra's book, we will turn to our next responder, who is uh, Dr. Stefan Ehring from the University of Haifa. Uh, and is part of the Department of General History in the Haifa Center of uh, German and European Studies. And actually, uh, Stefan will bring us to a different context since he has dealt uh, extensively with other kinds of genocide. I'll just mention uh, two of his publications. One of them is Ataturk in the Nazi Imagination and Justifying, the Genoc Justifying Genocide, Germany and the Armenians from Bismarck to Hitler. So I'll give you the floor and later on we'll open it for other comments and uh, reactions. Thank you very much. Great honor to be here <coughs> and to have a chance to comment on Raz's book. Um, I'll try to keep my comments short also because Alon took away some of my ideas, um, which always happens when you go second. And I'm sure you're eager to get into the discussion. Um, let me start by saying that I found his book a very elegant one. and. Um, I did so for many reasons. Um, as already was mentioned, it forces you to think about old concepts anew. And um, it actually raises, I think, a lot of questions in many different directions. Um, <coughs> um, I will present you some of them here. It's, it's, it's right, it's my perspective. I come from a different background. Um, I did work a little bit on Romanian history and I lived not far away in Transylvania actually from your region um, and there are many similarities there if you look at these um, post-imperial borderlands all across southeastern Europe um, for Romania they are as you perhaps remember from the map Transylvania then you have in the south um, southwest the Banat also then in Yugoslavia part of it uh, in the interwar years <clears throat> you have the Bukovina, again special from the other regions, and you have uh, today's uh, Republic of Moldova, Bessarabia in the east. And um, there you find different compositions of different ethnicities. Sometimes you have some more <coughs> clear majorities, sometimes you have pluralities, and you have very similar groups, often the same ethnic groups that Russ mentions uh, for his region here. And we have now a whole range of new studies that do something similar, perhaps not as inspired as your book, and also look at um, the inter-ethnic relations before the Holocaust in the interwar years, how they were all uh, um, co-opted and overshadowed by nationalizing projects and also by external um, concepts of the nation. For example, um, for the Germans and the Jews in Bessarabia, there is a very, I think, good uh, case study there. <coughs> And I also think, uh, as Alon already mentioned, Ra's book is um, at the forefront of a broader new trend that tries to combine basically the micro level with a sort of macro level, looking at the region, but at the same time looking at a much larger time frame, not only starting in the 30s or not even only in the interwar years, but stretching further back. And I thought it was very impressive how <coughs> you argued that here we're dealing actually with the region that had no deep-seated anti, uh, no deep-seated history of anti-Jewish sentiments, and that um, this, as well as also the history of nationalism in the region, is something that comes in the interwar years and is kind of brought from the outside. <coughs> I thought this is quite fascinating. How to understand what unfolded if there is no history of anti-Jewish um, uh, sentiments there? <coughs> um, and I think this is only really possible by looking at this larger expanded time uh, frame that you also opened here. There's other studies I really do want to mention. You mentioned Vladimir Solonar's book um, in your um, uh, research, uh, which was very uh, important for Romania, but is a little bit more focused uh, uh, in the time frame. There's another book by um, Ümit Ünger, looking at the violence in southeastern Turkey from World War I onwards until the 1930s. And <clears throat> World War I, the violence mainly targeted the Armenians, and then later on it targeted the Kurds, who basically transformed from uh, collaborators of this st state or party-inspired violence against the Armenians to actually victims in the second phase. So I, I think that's <coughs> an interesting parallel when one looks at, you know, this role of, you know, it's not, they are not bystanders, most of them, some of them of course are, 
um, this transformation, you know, in these different roles and to look at a region continually exposed uh, to ethnic restructuring and violence. <coughs> And um, what I thought so interesting also in this parallel to Romania and uh, you mentioning and uh, exploring a little bit the themes that Vladimir Solona in his book explored is this um, idea that these states, Hungary and Romania, <coughs> already in the interwar year, uh, period before the war starts, have this long shopping list of um, ethnic minorities they want to get rid of in their territories. <coughs> And um, it's quite shocking, actually, because the war ends and we know what happened to the groups that he discussed. But uh, as you mentioned also in your book, there were plans to get rid of so many other groups. You mentioned a uh, uh, hair-raising figure of uh, three million Romanians that the Hungarians thought they could just expel to Romania, transfer to Romania. And in the Romanian lists, too, you have, um, I think, at least more than uh, 10 different ethnic groups that they wanted to somehow get rid of. Jews and Roma at the top of the lists. Germans very practicable because they could be resettled uh, in the German Reich. But then Romania, for example, also had all these ideas of other states taking willingly uh, populations back that were never theirs to begin with. For example, Christian Turks in southern Bessarabia, and they just expected that Turkey would take them all back. And uh, all these wild expectations of uh, population transfers with these uh, long shopping lists, of course, also not only prepared the path for violence and heightened imagination, but also then uh, would create logistical problems that often were solved by murder and starvation. <coughs> um, Raz's book is full of very nice turns of phrases, very inspiring. Another reason to read it and to buy it. Um, I liked when you were comparing Hungary to um, the Third Reich, and you were making this point about the apocalyptic anxiety radiating from Berlin, and you, you found that in Hungary this was perhaps not the case as much as in uh, uh, Nazi Germany. But um, coming again from Romania, there is another perspective. Romania expanded uh, rapidly after World War I, gaining a lot of territories, doubling in size actually, a, a big winner in southeastern Europe of the post-war order. And they did actually have something of an apocalyptic an anxiety because they knew that they would have to do something to hold on to these regions. And their um, basic uh, strategy of justification to incorporating and holding on to this region next to historical claims was um, creating some sort of ethnic homogeneity. And um, they were under pressure and uh, you can feel these, this um, anxiety also in the Romanian documents of the time. So it is arguable, perhaps, uh, there is more to that also for Hungary, which also had this kind of similar idea, you know, that the clock was ticking on, uh, and there was going to be a deadline how to justify possession of new territories in the end. <clears throat> Another thing that came to mind, um, and this is again coming from the comparison, but also looking back at World War I and the Armenian Genocide, and it's a very unfortunate, um, perhaps, phrasing, is this idea of uh, the world war of a, or of a larger war as kind of an opportunity structure uh, in which you can realize things you otherwise couldn't realize. And it starts with the deportation of people into occupied territories, as Raz described, and then there was a conflict with the German authorities who didn't want to take them on board. <clears throat> but going back on the larger scale, there is this sense, you know, that um, war and also the overarching Nazi project for Europe um, creates an opportunity structure which radicalizes options and choices and outcomes. And as Raz stresses in his book, there is this long shopping list, but it wasn't necessarily envisaged that uh, Jews would be murdered and killed from the beginning. This came out of the development and out of these uh, structures that were basically offered um, to the Hungarian state at this stage. <coughs> Tying in with what I said earlier, also about these comparative um, studies in other places, I found very interesting, Ras has this case, as many cases actually, that he mentions and elaborates upon. There's this one case of an ethnic German in the region, Josef Strauss, <coughs> who hid um, Jews during the war and then after the war is dependent on the goodwill and on uh, one Jewish family especially to put in a good word with the Soviet authorities. <clears throat> and Raz describes how once the family actually, after helping him twice, um, 
emigrates um, to Palestine and then Strauss is deported and shortly afterwards dies in a Soviet um, uh, camp. I thought it was interesting to also you know, shed a light beyond 45 and how violence in the region continues and how people were indeed, after all, interdependent in some sort of way. <clears throat> um, I have more disconnected points than Alon, but I still want to uh, mention a few more. <clears throat> what I also thought was uh, fascinating for in your description of the interwar period was this integrative dilemma, we could phrase it, that Jewish populations faced in these post-imperial borderlands. <coughs> you show there that how um, in education and culture Jews reoriented away from Budapest to Prague, sent their kids to um, uh, Czech language schools and such, and how this in turn fueled distrust and uh, um, uh, suspicion of these groups. And then <coughs> in changing power relations in the region, region, Jews were faced with um, being accused of disloyalty from basically all groups and uh, mostly stemming out of choices of integration into some form of uh, state culture. I thought that was very interesting uh, to see how that plays out in these uh, different periods that you described there. <coughs> um, yeah. Um, again, uh, something we stressed already, I think it's very interesting to see how from this regional perspective and also from this international European perspective, there were these nationalizing projects in Hungary and Romania and also uh, as other people, and you mentioned them also, Alexander Korb, for example, for the Ustasha has described, how these various national projects converge with a broader Nazi vision uh, for Eastern Europe or for Europe. <coughs> and how, um, so to speak, there was um, a, a bottom-up development of ideology, of necessity, of discourse and um, of uh, violent solutions already on the ground and uh, did not only depend on the Nazi vision. Um, having worked now on the influences from basically uh, one, sen uh, one, one genocide to the next, from the Armenian genocide to the um, Holocaust and trying to trace how information was transmitted, who talked about these things and how <clears throat> you know you get basically from A to B, especially in the early, nine, uh, early 20th century where we're dealing with mass societies, with highly developed um, uh, print media, the press uh, especially. Um, it's kind of, it would have been more interesting for me personally to find out how Hungary was connected with all these things. You do mention, and I, I, um, I really uh, I like that, um, um, you mentioned how the Greco-Turkish population, uh, population exchange um, enshrined in the Treaty of Lausanne of 1923 inspired um, Hungarian leaders um, to seek similar solutions for their ethnic problems. <coughs> And uh, it would have been interesting to see, and I don't know if there's uh, easy, accessible uh, research or sources on that, how many other discussions there were in Hungary, how they were connected to discussions in Germany and in other places. A colleague of ours in Hungary, Peter Kranitz, um, a PhD student in Budapest, uh, he worked a little bit on the Armenian genocide and how it uh, influenced interwar debates in Hungary. And every time, basically almost every time that uh, anti-Jewish uh, measures are discussed before the Second World War, the Armenian Genocide is actually brought into the discussion as a warning um, uh, by Jewish groups and by other groups in Hungary. And I thought that was also very interesting <laughs> to see that these, you know, even though there is a national development to these discourses and solutions and ethnic shopping lists that these countries have, <clears throat> all these societies are talking to each other. They're in a constant exchange of ideas, which sounds overtly positive, but information is flowing back and forth. And what this colleague found for um, Hungary, I found similarly for Germany. Germany was aware of all these different influences, projects, was aware of this radiating um, example uh, from the post-Ottoman uh, solution <coughs> that you could change borders, that the international community would accept it, and that genocide can go unpunished. And probably, and um, the empirical evidence suggests it, the Hungarian debates when it comes, for example, to the Turkish model and the Armenian genocide and all these options of ethnic engineering 
um, came from German discourses in the interwar uh, years. Um, the Hungarian media, the newspapers were still closely connected to Vienna and also to Berlin. They were um, not only in exchange and copying articles and connected uh, through intellectuals, but you can, you can see bit by bit these discourses how they were the same, you know, and uh, how in a, put on a timeline they actually or originate in Germany rather than in Hungary. And um, so that's a dim dimension uh, I would have, um, I, I kind of want to know much more about as Vladimir Solonar does it in his book. Um, all these thinkers of ethnic engineering, how do they talk about it, how long have they been talking about it and to whom. <coughs> Um, one question I really wanted to ask Ras because his uh, book is, as I said, I find it very elegant and um, as a case study, um, you know, leaves you wanting more, more information on various aspects in the interwar years, various um, perspectives. Um, Ras is very um, adamant about us uh, rethinking the term bystander. I was wondering if you had more material on how these bystanders uh, reflect on their actions. There are so many points where the reader wants more, which I think is not only criticism, is a, qu a great compliment. Um, I was wondering, you know, uh, collecting these sources, uh, going through them, if there were a lot of things you would have expected to turn out differently. Um, if there were a lot of sources you didn't use uh, that shed more light into similar uh, things that you describe in your book, <clears throat> if there was kind of a radical transition at some point in your work where you thought this is uh, turning out much more different than I expected, that's always interesting. Um, I had one more. Yeah, I'm actually going to leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you very Okay, so let's open the floor for a few more comments, uh, question or whatever, and then of course uh, Raz will be able to comment. So any question, comments, anything? Uh, and people can ask in Hebrew. Yeah, you can ask in Hebrew. I not, not everybody together. <laughs> Sagi, um, maybe you need to use the mic or... Oh. I think people can hear me or... Oh, for the recording, yeah, not because of me. Oh, you can. Yeah. So, <laughs> part of the... Okay, just uh, a quick uh, question. It comes up, I think, a bit in Stefan's words at the end. Uh, you talked about contextualizing what happened in the Carpathians. Uh, and generally uh, the Holocaust even, or parts of it. And I thought uh, maybe there's a, a, an, an another layer to the context. Uh, that is, it seems like it from the, the end of World War I, say, when empires sort of collapsed in Europe, there's been an attempt to find a solution for a stable existence in multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-religious multi areas of Central and Eastern Europe, and there have been a couple of models that have been tried since the end of the First World War, right? There were minority treaties, there were uh, ethnic cleansings, as in uh, the Turk Turkish and Greek case, and um, there were other uh, options, plebiscites, for instance, in all sorts of regions. By the end of, or by the later stages of the Second World War, it seems like there's a been a unanimous move towards ethnic cleansing. And here I thought this isn't just a German, a Russian, or a Hungarian project. Churchill was very much for it. Western European leaders generally were very much for it. So I wondered if you can say how your book sees, uh, if that is also a context for what is happening. 